to overlook how quickly time goes by in the beer business. Um, and as I was thinking about how to introduce our next speaker, uh, Jeremy Cohen, the founder of Schmaltz Brewing, I decided to look back at what was happening in the world uh, of brewing back in 2013. And that was the year, as I mentioned earlier, that um, Jeremy you know, started to turn his business model upside down. Um, he went to a brick and mortar facility from being a contract brewer, uh, built his own brewery in upstate New York after 16 years of kind of beating the drum for contract brewing. Uh, even wrote a book about it, I believe. <laughs> uh, in 2013, Jim Cook became a billionaire of Boston beer, and he finally uh, he decided to make his own strong push in the IPA category. Uh, New Belgium co-founder Kim Jordan sold her remaining interest in the company to an ESOP and uh, detailed plans for a national distribution and rebranded their beer, rebranded their look. Uh, craft brewers across the country were expanding capacity and uh, building secondary f uh, brewing facilities, which they still are. Simon Thorpe laid out his plans to purchase two or three breweries. Uh, it, uh, he's the CEO of Duval. And then they would later acquire Boulevard Brewing just a couple months after he said, hey, we're planning to buy a couple breweries. Um, and there were only 2,800 craft breweries at the time. I say only because there's uh, 4,500 now. Uh, and they were making 15.5 million barrels of beer. Uh, it's about 24.5 now. And uh, that was 2013. And as Jeremy was watching all of this unfold, he decided that it was time to pivot. He ditched his contract model, he sold his Coney Island brand to Boston Beer, built a brewery, and began rebranding. And that's why Jeremy's here today, to discuss the process of restructuring his company, uh, the thought process at the time, how it's worked out, and why it's critical for brewery entrepreneurs to be mindful of their company's futures. So, Jeremy, come on up and take it away. Good morning, everybody. Come on, seriously? It's not a sales meeting, people. We're here for fun and learning and talking smack, so let's do some of that. Um, the, uh, the title that Chris gave me was Nimble Pivot, which sounds really awesome. That sounds very smart and thoughtful, and uh, your introduction gives me a lot more credit than I think I deserve for pivoting nimbly because uh, the other thing he said on the phone was, really, it's adapt or die. That sounds a little less glamorous and romantic. Um, but today, what the, the talk that I want to give is, is actually, it should be entitled um, On the Cusp. Because On the Cusp has honestly been 20 years of Schmaltz Brewing history. And I, I want to read you something from, uh, from a book I wrote. And this was a while ago. It was uh, for our 13th anniversary. It's called Craft Beer Bar Mitzvah. And, um, I wrote, uh, during every interview I'd done about Hebrew beer, the reporter would inev inevitably ask, so, are you profitable? <laughs> the truth, uh, potential entrepreneurs, is that I didn't break even until many, many years into this project, uh, and even that was break even for the first year. Uh, my standard comeback had become, well, you know, I'm on the cusp of profits. So my first, uh, my first sales rep, Rob, would give me endless crap about that. Every email I got from him, he was my first sales manager for nine months, and every email I got from him at a certain point would start with something like, well, I'm on the cusp of selling a case of beer and coming to meet you for happy hour. So uh, I think on the cusp is, uh, we're gonna walk through a few things, and on the cusp really, I would say, is more appropriate than nimble pivot. Um, so a couple of things I wanna talk about today. Uh, and, and the way that Andy said are a lot more questions than answers. Listen, you, anybody who knows me knows that uh, I was an English major who started a beer company, and honestly, when people ask me all the time, oh, were you a home brewer, or were you a business guy, or your family's in the business, and I'm like, no, none of it, absolutely nothing. Why'd you start a beer company? I'm like, I thought it would be hilarious to have a beer called Hebrew the Chosen Beer. Ta-da! It worked! <laughs> Nimble pivot. Um, so some of the questions that uh, I want to ask are um, uh, focused on different elements of the business. First of all, since Chris loves this and, and I love working with him on it, is brand. Like, what's your brand? You know, you guys heard uh, some heavy hitters here talking about uh, some of the bigger picture stuff. But every day, really what we struggle with is what's our brand? 
Uh, for me, it's, is it a super niche Jewish deli and bar mitzvah beer that uh, can go to a couple of places around the country? Um, is it a freak show themed beer that's gonna show up where people are into that type of culture? Or am I trying to reach a broader audience um, to go more mainstream, which I'm pretty sure most of you can, can guess is not my goal. So today, talking about brand is a question, and I'm gonna walk through a couple of things about the history of the company, and you'll see it play out, and then Chris and I will talk about things. Um, a huge thing is distribution. We talked about it kind of over uh, in an overarching fashion, but this is right now, today, literally the most important thing that I'm going through is distribution. So when I started, I was a self-distributor in Northern California. I self-distributed for a year, and then I switched to tiny little independent wholesalers uh, in 1997 who had little brands like Sierra Nevada that had some chain authorizations and uh, 20 or 40 other craft brands, most of whom didn't. And um, that was who I was with for so many years. So then the question is, uh, do you go deep in your home territory, which most of you should always do, and everybody knows that's the smart way to build a beer company, or should you do what I did, which was scatter to the winds a couple of cases of beer into the entire country, chasing the few Jews that are 2% of the population, <laughs> Half of whom are too old, and half of them are too young, and half of them don't drink, but you're never gonna get enough in San Francisco, or Denver, or Chicago, or even New York to sustain an actual beer company. So the go deep or go wide has been a fun source of discussion, and we'll continue with that. The other thing lately is um, what defines your home market? Because that's a very important thing. If you're in New York City, uh, there's a lot of people and a lot of geography and a lot of retailers. And if you're in a smaller place, that may be a very different decision. For instance, Clifton Park, New York. Uh, Clifton Park is my home market. And there are about, I don't know, 100,000 people that live within a, an easy toss from the brewery. But certainly, uh, it's been an interesting dynamic to try to grow a brand that was, when I started, 17 years old and now is in its third year in a town like Clifton Park. So what's your home market? Uh, the other thing that we don't talk about today, and I hope we will, is what type of distribution are you talking about? I mean, we're talking about this, this week. I have now had my smallest wholesaler and my biggest wholesaler in the same week with completely different things happening, both of which were the absolute best thing that could happen for my company. The smallest guys in the state of Georgia are not officially named this, but it's Two dudes in a truck distributing company covering the entire state of Georgia. And I am totally confident that they are going to sell more beer in the next two weeks than my past wholesalers sold in the last few months because of questions of focus and brand and, you know, kind of some structural issues. At the same time, I switched my entire network in, northern, uh, in upstate New York to the Budweiser network and went from a smaller uh, independent company. And that was the best thing for me. So that, there's, there's no right answer to any of this, um, but I think it's questions that need to be raised, is what type of distribution are you working on? Um, as far as product goes, this was one of my favorite things for all those years, right? We're, some of us started these businesses because we were business people, and others started because we thought it would be funny, or we were artists, or freaks, or outsiders, and just wanted to make beer. Wouldn't that be cool? Oh my God, I'm living the dream. This is the greatest job ever and then you had to pay for it, and then you had rent, and then you had employees, and then you had health insurance, um, all of which we now have, and the question is how do you pay for all of that? So given that, if you're trying to be an artist and be creative, what's a flagship? I mean, remember, not that long ago at Craft Brewers Conference, we were talking about how flagship was really a dirty word. Nobody wanted to be known as 60 Minute Brewing Company, wanted to be known as Dogfish. I didn't want to be known as, oh wait, I don't have a flagship. <laughs> I bet you can't even name my number one selling beer, or number two or number three. So what do I do in that environment where now people want all day IPA, right? That's what they want. And so you need a flagship and your wholesaler wants you to have a flagship. So what are you gonna do about it? And I am totally not sure. So if you have any good ideas, come tell me. Uh, but we're working on it. So in terms of product mix, margin versus volume is a huge part of that as well. Uh, we have a lot of specialty beers for Schmaltz Brewing Company. 
And uh, that really, in the same way Alan mentioned, the tap room essentially keeps some brands afloat. For us, when I was a contract brewer, that was my specialty line. We started doing barrel aging and some sour beers and some beers that were very high ABV and participating in an extreme beer fest, and that made a huge difference. So then pricing has come up, and I really hope that some of the bigger players really talk about this, because if you really want to argue and point fingers, the question is how can we run an industry on $12.99 and $14.99 uh, 12 packs when we're trying to run craft breweries? So as we talk about six pack pricing into bottles, cans, 12 packs, variety packs, I think that's gonna be something very important to, uh, to raise. Um, and that's been a big challenge for us as a small brewer. And then finally, like listen, identity crisis. Are you an artist or are you a capitalist? Artists, anybody? I don't know, anybody? <laughs> Cap capitalists, not even that many of them, right? Oh dude, bro, I'm a Bernie, not a capitalist. <laughs> Just want to run the biggest economy in the world. It's a capitalist society, and that's what we're dealing with every day, every single day. Buying, selling, you got some money, you need more money, you got to go make some money. So that's a question that has really come up uh, on an identity crisis. The, the last one is the production question. And uh, I used to get up in front of um, uh, and talk in front of groups, and I said, I'm, a, I'm what's called a dirty word in craft beer. It's called contract brewer. And... That was a dirty word for a long time, but I didn't have the money not to be a contract brewer, and I honestly kind of liked it. I got to cruise around the country and think up cool beers, and somebody else actually had to schlep and make it. Um, and, and we got, kind of reached a point where that model didn't work anymore. So to Chris's point, we'll talk a little bit about the transition between contract brewing and in-house brewing, and what's that, what, what has that meant uh, for schmaltz brewing for me, but it also then went all the way back, I realized, through this lineup, which is every issue, branding, distribution, product mix, art versus commerce, um, and a business model. It changed every one of those things once you open the brewery. Um, some for better, some for worse, some for different, then that's okay. So these are questions that, that we'll go over. I'm gonna hopefully guess that this is something that moves a slide. Nice. Oh yeah, that's good. All right, so um, I'll quickly go through a little bit of the history of the company. And uh, uh, when I started in San Francisco, that was my apartment and my hair and my skinny little arms. Um, so uh, this was obviously not attempting to be the next big anything. I mean, that's the artwork uh, from my girlfriend at the time with a giant green dancing rabbi over the stones of Jerusalem and the Golden Gate Bridge. <laughs> and uh, it was supposed to be like a dancing kind of rabbi, fun Chagall reference, which everybody thought looked like Godzilla. <laughs> and um, I got a lot of good PR. I mean, let me tell you, we got a lot of good shtick out of the writers. They loved that. Oy vey, for this he spent four years in college. like. <laughs> Come on, that's in the San Francisco Chronicle. You'd think they'd be a little more creative, but you know what, I asked for it. I had a beer company when I started that I honestly thought was a Jewish nonprofit. I thought it was a community-based organization and everybody else agreed with me. It was Jewish and not profitable. So uh, it, it did its trick. Um, 2003, um, I was contract brewing with Anderson Valley, moved all the production to the East Coast. This was a fun, fun moment where people would say, oh cool, yeah, I like Hebrew beer, where are you from? And I'm like, I'm from San Francisco, I started the company in my apartment in the Mission, brewed at Anderson Valley for seven years, then moved all the production to the East Coast, to Old Saratoga Brewing, which is owned by Mendocino from Northern California by an Indian company, and now I live on my friend's couch in Brooklyn, and I'm traveling around the country all the time. They're like, that doesn't fit on a shelf talker. That doesn't fit on your business card. So, uh, but that's the truth. I, uh, I moved the production and I got on the road and did the 40 days and 40 nights, the wandering Hebrew beer tour of America. And it lasted for five straight years. And um, I didn't have an apartment and I just went and saw all these kind of people, some friends and some strangers and sold some beer. It was a you know, simpler time, it was totally different. And, uh, and it went pretty well and I was able to uh, charge $50,000 to my credit cards and pay off the $50,000 the first time. But as the company grew, I then had to do it again and do it again and keep rolling that through the, uh, 
through the free, you'll remember the 0% financing credit card transfer balances. So that went on for about five or six years. Um, and that's when we got to this kind of cool, cool moment in the company of the history. I'd had Hebrew beer all over the country. Go wide, go wide, go wide. And then introduce one seasonal. <laughs> and then I got so greedy, I wanted more seasonals. I wanted more beer. It was so delicious to make beers that were 10 malts, 10 hops, 10% alcohol, and put them in a whiskey barrel. And oh my god, then it's so yummy. And people love it. And it gets a 98 on rape beer. And I feel like, awesome. So let's just make more of that. And so we made more skews, and we like to proliferate them. And that's what we do. We make more stuff, and it's awesome. So when a guy came to me and said, how would you like to do an entire other project? Uh, it's called Coney Island. And I was like, that sounds awful. There's only two of us at that point, myself and Matt, my art director. How would we possibly do another whole brand? And we started thinking about it. And we thought, well, screw it. Let's try. <laughs> What's the worst that will happen? I already paid off the credit card debt. Let's do it up again. So we did an entire another brand. And at that point, we were very, very lucky to be working with an amazing organization in Coney Island, talking about authenticity and transparency and creativity and all around amazingness. Um, we had people like um, Heather and Donnie, the MC of the Circus Sideshow, and we had an amazing time with Coney Island. We got tattoo artists from Brooklyn who did an absolutely world-class a uh, piece of art for us and a bunch of them. We even opened the officially world's smallest brewery in Coney Island. I figured that was my first brick and mortar. It was a 175 square foot storefront attached to the freak show. And if anybody was around at the time, they might remember that yes, our first brewmaster was Nick Sin, the midget. He was, a, uh, the, he was the world's shortest Satanist at three foot six, six inches tall. And uh, we had a good time. There's the, there's the brewery, man. Talk about authentic. That's a three-vessel, gravity-fed. Man, I didn't even know what it was. You know, as, as you'll recall, I'm not a brewer. I just thought it'd be awesome to have it. So um, that was an inexpensive way to get into the craft beer segment. And uh, we tried to do it right and had a great time. So um, again, as you could tell, this is, you know, a, a, a simpler time. Um, uh, there weren't quite as many local breweries, and we had awesome stuff, and I had a great time, and that, that really uh, was a wonderful era that then led us to have about 25 different beers um, under the Schmaltz Brewing banner. 25 different beers, which today is only half of what some of the biggest craft regional brewers have, but at the time was completely unmanageable for one person with one sales manager rep, rep managing four sales reps and an art director. So as we started looking um, at a couple things, what's the future of contract brewing in 2012 and 11? Uh, it was not good. Um, now we're complaining about too much capacity. Or, or, um, then there was no capacity, literally. My, the brewery I was contracting with didn't have any more, wouldn't let me put more beer in the warehouse. And the next step up was from a 100 barrel brew house to a, really like a 500 barrel brew house. Now you've got some cool options. But we didn't do that at the time. We built our own brewery. So we put out a beer called Death of a Contract Brewer. It was a fun project. Uh, black IPA we put out for our opening party. We bought all that stuff on SBA loans. And it uh, wasn't quite 0% uh, financing, but uh, it, they helped me out a lot. And we got a 20,000 square foot warehouse in Clifton Park, New York. Um, we had an option on the other half, which this year I was very happy to be able to take over the other half of the warehouse. So now we have a 40,000 square foot warehouse, 50 barrel brew house from JV Northwest. We opened with 1,200 barrels of capacity and fermentation. Now we have 2,000 and we're just getting ready to expand that um, onto some smaller batch uh, projects. We have a tasting room that is about 1,700 square feet, which has been really awesome. Um, in a town like Clifton Park, it's been a kind of a brain changing experience for me who grew up uh, drinking beer in San Francisco and Brooklyn and everywhere like it to drive around the suburbs and have to drink really awesome craft beer. My big mistake last year was our anniversary party. Um, I thought, wouldn't it be so cool, the first half, it's our second anniversary up there, the first half we'll do session beers, kind of entry level stuff. We have 15 different brewers from around the country. Second half, big stuff, barley wines, double IPAs, barrel aged stuff. And then at 4.45, I'm looking around, I'm like, everybody is hammered. And they're all about to drive somewhere. <laughs> so
So this year we're not doing that. <laughs> we're going to uh, take it a little slower. But, you know, we have, we have about 500 people at our anniversary party. Um, Tasting Room does okay, could do better and better and better. Scotty's my inspiration. I just keep telling them the numbers that he does. So um, I'm looking forward to that. And uh, it's been a wild adventure. And in the process of that, uh, I had a conversation with Alan that you know from earlier. And uh, uh, it was an old friend. And we literally, I was on the phone with him talking about a t-shirt for his marketing rep's dad. And we have a t-shirt that says, Hebrew the Chosen Beer on the front. And on the back, it says, don't pass out, pass over. It was the original punchline <laughs> from uh, 20 years ago. And Stacy said, oh, can I get a t-shirt for my dad? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm sure. I was in Williamsburg. I remember the exact block I was on behind Barcade. And, uh, and Alan just, Stacy got off the phone, and I'm like, so what are you up to, man? Like, what's the deal with this whole alchemy and science thing? And he told me, and, um, and I don't know. We, neither one of us totally remembers what happened, but all of a sudden we were talking about, well, it seems like Coney Island could be kind of a cool brand for that portfolio. I've been trying to open a little place in Brooklyn. It's really expensive. The next step for Coney Island really needs to be a big step, and I can't, I'm not sure I'm the guy to do it from 22-ounce boutique bottles that are all 7 to $10 to six packs that need to be at a certain price point and that, what that means. So we did it. We worked out a deal and sold uh, Coney Island to Alan and um, it's been a wild adventure for both of us, for me especially, and uh, uh, that was a big pivot. So this um, has been another thing. Uh, through that process I realized, wow, we just built a brewery that needs to make a bunch of stuff, so we better get on it. So how are we gonna make more stuff when I just sold half our stuff? It's like, oh, well, I guess we're going to contract. So Alan generously let me make some Coney for him for a couple years. And then we brought on other contracts. It was part of the original business model was going to be 80% Schmaltz Brands, 20% contract for friends and family. And it ended up being, well, I just sold half our business. So let's go make more Hebrew. And uh, so we introduced new seasonals and put out new products and rapidly tried to expand our portfolio. And then I think you heard um, of this, 2,500 new breweries opened at exactly the same time that we tried that. So we got the portfolio done. That was awesome. People love the products. I personally love drinking them. And now it's just a question of how do you sell it and how do you grow it and how do you manage it? So a big pivot for us was uh, the go wide or go deep has been reinvent the brewery as a local brewery in upstate New York and expand from kind of the way I look at it as like Syracuse, Rochester, Buffalo and the city. And then you do a little Western Mass, a little Vermont. And that's our home market for the moment. Um, but remember, I'm from San Francisco. I don't want to give up my, my boys at the bars down in the Mission, and I don't want to give up my friends in Texas, and I don't want to give up my friends in Florida. So we're going to maintain this national footprint for as long as humanly possible, given what a crazy shit going on in the market right now. And so we are literally changing a lot of times from those big craft distributors that have brands like Dogfish and Stone and Founders, and we're going to some tiny little guys. And then for the companies that want to keep working with us for those bigger regional brands, we're going to just try the best we can to maintain sales reps in the markets and keep our visits and do our marketing and, and make the story something special and make kick-ass beer. So one of the things we did, and last but not least, um, we kind of had this identity. Everybody knew the brand is Hebrew, right? And so that was on purpose because I didn't have a brewery. And I used the model of Sam Adams 20 years ago. I was like, well, everybody asked for a Sam Adams, so that's your brand. But you got to have a name for a company. So I made it up. I was like, oh, let's do Schmaltz Brewing Company. That sounds good. Um, if anybody knows Schmaltz, what's it mean in Yiddish again? Chicken fat? Yeah, yes. An obvious name to name a brewery. So chicken fat in Yiddish. Um, also kind of like a decadent comfort food, right? A, a kind of a, a nod to sentimental past. It also means an irreverent sense of humor, kind of uh, over, just over the top. Sid Caesar, Mel Brooks, Henny Youngman, uh, Rodney Dangerfield, Seinfeld. That felt comfortable for me. Um, and then in the middle of the word schmaltz is the word malt. And even when I didn't know really that much about beer and the industry, I did know that great malt was going to be really, really important. It was important from the very, very beginning, even when I thought it was a joke, even when I wanted to sell to bar mitzvahs, and even when I wanted to be in uh, uh, you know, every market in the country as a kind of a gimmick, honestly, I still wanted great beer. That's why I was with Anderson Valley, and that's why I was with Mendocino. So how do we communicate that now that we have a brewery? And that's been a big conversation. And instead of like throwing the baby out with the bathwater, we decided to just make adjustments. So you can see here the old labels 
for Hebrew and the new labels for Schmaltz Brewing Company, which makes a brand called Hebrew. I don't know. Does it work? I'm not sure. I love the new labels. They match. That's kind of awesome. <laughs> We've had labels you can see from the past, from the last 15 years, that some of them were on the shelf next to each other, and you're like, so what's Schmaltz Brewing? What's Hebrew? But I like Genesis. Am I drinking a Hebrew? Give me the mana. Give me, I, they just didn't even know what to ask for. So now we're going to try to get it so people ask for Schmaltz Brewing. And uh, we have a brewery. You should come visit. Our anniversary party is on the 25th. We have 15 breweries from the region there. And uh, you can come check it out and see if we've solved anything or caused more problems than we, uh, than we solved. But either way, our business now is 50% in the state of New York. Um, so that's really exciting. And uh, I'm, just, I'm just thrilled that we've been able to survive the last couple of years with some pretty cool things coming up on the horizon to be able to make these amazing, amazing beers and barrels and sours and, and hops and malts and just have a great a great business that hopefully is going to be sustainable through this uh, very interesting transition. So there you go, ladies and gentlemen, Schmaltz Brewing Company, pivoting. Oh, wait, yeah, on the cusp. <laughs> right. So are you profitable? Uh, are you profitable? I don't know. Obviously, some of us are and have been, and some of us aren't and haven't been. So I will say that I was very profitable to a part that was just enough to get by in 2015. Hell yeah, made it happen. Uh, 2016, a couple things changed. We are aggressively pivoting right now, this month, and uh, things are actually going pretty well. I was able to acquire um, a local brand here in New York City uh, called Alphabet City, which is really exciting. We're going to start working um, on some of their branding, and Jason, Jeff, and Red have been amazing to work with. And, um, we're really excited about Alphabet City. We have a hyper-local brand called 518. It's all session beers, 5.18%, brewed in the 518, distributed in the 518. Um, and we still have Schmaltz in Hebrew, and when somebody puts it on a chalkboard or a menu, they don't know what to put, and it's okay. And if they spell Schmaltz wrong, it's okay. We're going to get Google to autocorrect to SH next year instead of SCH. And it's all fine. Let's just, we're trying to survive, make some great beer, have some fun along the way, and be sustainably profitable so we can keep going. So uh, with that, I will invite Mr. Chris to come up <clears throat> and uh, let's have a chat. Let's do it. Am I Thank sitting you. with you or standing yeah. with you? Oh, let's go over here. Whoa, okay. Thank you, everybody. Check, check, check. Thank you for that. My Thank you for that. Um, so, you know, that last slide that you had up there, in many ways, um, it, you guys have sort of complicated it even, even more, it seems. <laughs> yeah. Is that a question <laughs> or a statement? <laughs> Thank well, you, Well, I mean, you know, you've, uh, you've definitely had to pivot, but you've kind of made it harder on yourself as well by, you know, still continuing to branch out with all these different identities. What's that process been like? Well, well, the way I look at it was that I was very lucky. We had Schmaltz Brewing and Hebrew Beer in 35 states around the country, and I had really a cool distribution network. So wouldn't it be awesome to roll out new products into that network and, and not have to totally build a brand? You can send some cool seasonal one-offs and make some dough and make some awesome stuff. Um, that has become harder and harder and harder because every region in the country has awesome stuff, and it's all made locally, and the people live down the street, and that's amazing too. So... I think right now what I did was we're going to keep Schmaltz and Hebrew National as long as possible, and we're going to focus on uh, eventually when I can get a couple of minutes of brain space on Alphabet City here in the city, and we're going to do 518 in our local market, and hopefully those won't cannibalize each other. Hopefully those will complement each other, and that might be um, a naive thing to think, and I certainly will find out, but when I go in and I want to sell a beer style like a Blondale from Alphabet City, Will that take away from my ability to sell our golden lager called Slingshot from Schmaltz Brewing? I hope that those won't compete with each other. I mean, listen, we're not t I'm not turning into the next Gallo or J. Lord. That's not happening. <laughs> we're trying to make some really awesome beers and have some cool brands and make sure I can cover payroll and cover the loan. That's really where it's at right now. There's, there, I, I say to my wholesalers, I'm not trying to be the next big anything. Right. So at this point, we're pretty close. And, um, and, and when need you to say that, more beer. when you say that to them, what do they say back? Now that they have <laughs> a lot of brands that aren't trying to be the next big anything. Uh, well, I also, honestly, my wholesalers find it refreshing that at least I understand what's going on in the market. When I sit down with them and say, 
I know how many local beers. I mean, five years, three years ago, so a lot of my wholesalers had one or two local brands, and now they have 11 or 12, and they have a special page in their sales book that has local beer, and we're certainly not going to be on that. So that's fine. We have to just go back into those retailers that did business with us, and we have to remind them and remind them and remind them, and we have to be more hungry and aggressive and hustle harder. Um, we have to make interesting beers that still stand out and are in between beer styles, so you're not just reinventing somebody else's saison. Um, but then in our home market, we got to get a little more focused, and that's something that's a big challenge for me. I loved being a little bit of everywhere, and I just was cruising around making it happen, man. Now you got to be like, no, numbers. How'd you do this week? How'd you do last week? This Memorial Day versus last Memorial Day. Like, get your act together. So uh, I'm trying to focus on that a little bit. Right. How difficult has it been to, uh, you know, to go into your wholesalers and talk about these things and, and actually, you know, continue to have that mind share in the marketplace with such limited resources? Oh, man, it's brutal. It's brutal. If, any, if anybody is selling beer more than 500 miles from your home, from where the brewery is, you know it. I don't care what brand it is. When you go more than 500 miles right now, there are 10 or 20 or 50 local brewers, two of whom used to work at the big brewery in town that everybody knows. Like, I used to think Jamie at Ninkasi, I was like, where did that come from? How, he all of a sudden showed up in San Francisco. And then he goes, no, no, dude, I worked for Steelhead for 13 years. Everybody knew my IPAs. And I was like, oh, well, that's a success story. That's a wild success story. And that is happening around the country. People who used to work at Cigar City or Dogfish or whoever opened their own brewery and they're making amazing beers. And those of us who've been around for 20 years and making, I would say, amazing beers for at least 10 of them um, <laughs> were, uh, were, are struggling with that. But you know what? If it, it, it's fine. More people want great beer. So innovate, be creative, be different. And you know, I can't price our beer at, at the price that's going to be volume-based. So it's never going to happen. So I have to compete in a different way. Is that a big concern for you? I mean, you mentioned the playing the 12.99 12-pack game. It's brutal. I was just in Connecticut two days ago. And I'm like, there's a variety pack from a regional brewery that's not even the biggest brewery that's, you know, 14.99. I'm like, wait a second. Let me let me remember. What did it take to make a variety pack at our brewery? We have to run. We don't have. We have a great bottling line and everything's manual on and manual off. So we're literally packaging four times to get a variety pack. And unfortunately, we're competing in a marketplace that has brewers that look at a variety pack as marketing, not as product. So they're just getting people to sample their goods. Right. So they're like, great, let's drop the price three or four bucks. I'm like, why didn't we just charge $24.99 for a variety pack? That's what we should have done. And then we could all like, try things out and have a little bit of t breathing room but that's not what's happening so you know i'm the wrong i'm in the wrong it's not going to work so now you just got to do something different right so the way that you're set up now how does that better prepare you for long-term sustained growth as opposed to uh, how you had been operating for 16 years yeah well i'm really not i'm not really that different honestly <laughs> we did do a few things to help our uh, wholesalers and our own sales team we really uh, uh limited our core brands we used to have eight and then when coney island we had 12 or 14 core brands every day we now have four lager ale lighter darker hoppy very hoppy that's you know it's pretty simple on the on the then on the rotator side though it's our 20th anniversary this year and I went a little bit nuts and I just wanted to make all this amazing beer so we're making it it's being made some of it has smaller volumes than before but it'll be that much more special some of it I raised the hell out of the price knowing that we're only going to sell a case to certain certain bottle shops anyway and we'd always been a little bit on the more modest side price wise so I figured let's just go for it and then you just have to get out and hustle and talk to the wholesalers. They're going to tell you exactly what's going on. They're, they know what's going on, and they're going to tell you. And if you don't listen, um, as a small brewer, you're going for a lot of pain. As a big brewer, that's a diff those are different struggles and different strategies. So that's why I think for me, um, I love working with the smaller side of life. When, when we started the New York City Brewers Guild, that was really meaningful to me. And we were able to work with so many small breweries and really understand the market in a different way. And, and that's where I like to live. That's just, that's where I'm personally more comfortable.
But you're a big time acquirer now. <laughs> yeah, we're taking over, man. Yeah. A thousand barrels of Alphabet City. <laughs> um, that actually was also a totally no brainer when it came down to it. I'd known Jason and Jeff since they, before they started, I was selling them beer at the frying pan and I helped them think about contract brewing. And then when we opened, that's the kind of friend I wanted to brew for. So we had, they were doing 800 barrels or something. Um, we, they got it up to a thousand barrels and then they looked around and we talked about it and you're like it's a thousand barrels There's two of you and a full-time sales rep Thousand barrels. How are you ever gonna make this work? I mean, you're you're not there's no future in this you can either raise a bunch of money You can either open a tap room or you can do what I did when I first started Which was I li I essentially licensed my brand to Anderson Valley and he paid me on the back end a couple of bucks per case so it was a really fun, and I think it, in the end, uh, hopefully it's going to be a really successful collaboration and partnership. I love working with those guys. They're really hard workers, and they know a lot of people, and they've created a really amazing brand. I mean, it's Alphabet City. That's like my, you know, it's my great-grandparents thinking about it, and, um, and then a lot of the comedians and punk rockers and uh, beatniks that I loved so much um, thinking a lot about that, too. Awesome. Well, you're doing some good things. You're still here after 20 years. <laughs> Shockingly. So yeah. congratulations to that. And uh, I'd say cheers, but I guess I'll say L'chaim. Yeah, L'chaim. Cheers. Right on.